Thank you for coming. This is our um, January 2003 is when we started. So we're starting our, our 22nd year of programs um, in, um, isn't it? Or is it 20? We've done, it. oh, I didn't do my math right. Anyway, welcome. We've been doing programs for a long time and we're eager to start the new year with beavers. Um, before we start the beaver program though, I wanted to tell you a little bit about our Camino Wildlife Habitat project where we're creating an island in harmony with nature one yard at a time. So we do this um, because it's kind of, um, rather than sob about all the loss and, and the logs rolling off the island, this is an action step. So if we um, do something in our yards, and a lot of us are doing things in our yards to provide food for water, food for the wildlife and habitat for them and space for them, then we um, can link our yards up and link our um, the parks up and, and it, it's doing something. Uh, so it's an action step for individuals as well as the community. So when we're talking about landscaping for wildlife, it's thinking about layering and, and having um, spaces for um, both nesting as well as just sheltering. Like um, sheltering is a really big deal right now. Like if you, some people leave their Christmas trees out in the yard so they have like a, a little area that's more shelter. Um, so anyway, my yard started out in, um, November 94 as being not much habitat at all and I could see out across the bay and everything was kind of sterile. Then in 2007 we had already done the left side of our property and then currently it, it's it's total habitat so we don't have any grass in the yard anymore. We do have some in the driveway um, that the bunnies seem to like. So when you talk about landscaping for wildlife, we're doing it in layers. So there's ground cover, there's understory, and then there's trees. And so that gives the various critters what they want because the critters like various levels. So food, water, sp um, places to raise young and shelter are the things that we need in the, in the yard, as well as thinking about how we are being responsible in our in what we do in the yard. So that can be reducing lawn. So you, especially on Kameno with a single source aquifer and, and water being an issue, reducing lawn helps both the water, wildlife as well as ourselves. So growing natives is a great way to do that to help with water conservation because they can thrive when um, more um, things from the nursery that are ornamental need more help with the water. Um, also, it's a work in progress when you certify your yard, but the I ideal is to eliminate the pesticide use, but you, you can do that in, in um, increments. You don't have to be a purist right away. And so reducing fertilizer use and planting material, reusing composting, and I'm trying to talk too fast, so I'm stumbling. I apologize for that. Um, but anyway, you can read it there. There's lots of different ways that you can be a responsible and a sustain, sustainable gardener. And when you um, do that, and a lot of people on the island are doing that, and a lot of people in Washington state are doing that, and a lot of people in the nation are doing that, we are having action steps with communities so that people are thinking about sharing our space rather than just um, having a nice spot for ourselves that's sterile for the wildlife. So to certify your yard is pretty simple. It's an application that just shows you check off how you're providing food, water, shelter, and places to raise young, noting that this is a work in progress. So you don't have to be a, you know, it doesn't, you don't have to check every block, box or line every at once. You do it as you do it in your yard. So you only need, you need three things to check off for food, one thing to check off for water, two things for places to raise young and for cover, which are many of the same things that you use for food because it's the plants that are in the yard. And then there's various things that you can check off in the uh, sustain sustainable gardening part. Like for instance, when I started the project in 2002, I had two elder kitties who could still go outside, but they mainly like to uh, line a sunbeam. Now I have well, now I have two senior kitties again, they're 18 and a half, but they've never been outside 
so when I got my new Moxie and Mindy kitties, they never got to experience running around outside. So they're safer inside and the birds and everything else are safer without them out there. So it's, it, that was a work in progress for me. And, and that is how um, the application for certification is considered. It's like, this is what I'm doing now. And then I'm conscientiously thinking about what I'm doing in my yard. Like, you know, the past few days I've been going back and forth with the hummingbird feeder and keeping it out at night, um, taking it down at night and putting it up and have a light shining on it. And, um, and today the little hummer was, was waiting for me. The other days that I think it was just kind of in that little dormancy state because um, it was so very, very cold and that's their survival mechanism. And anyway, so this application you can find on our website. This one's special. It's, it's the same as the backyard wildlife application you'd find on the National Wildlife Federation website. But this one we have you send to Camino and I count. So right now we have uh, 1,057 certified habitats on the island, which is pretty cool. We're, we're like 100 off from Seattle and we have 13,000 and Seattle has, you know, a million. So we have... Um, they have a good project on the island. Otherwise, you can go online and certify just directly. But it's $20 uh, application fee. And with that, you, you get a certificate. And you also will get the magazine, um, the National Wildlife Magazine, for a year. And then you can decide whether you want to continue getting that. This issue is pretty um, interesting. It has a, um, a story about uh, the way the, the, the wildlife um, survive. There's a cute little fox that's all curled up when he's surviving with all that, that nice coat of fur that it, he has. And so anyway, that's, that's one of the options when you certify your yard. But it's a um, note, it's, I know that when we first started, people thought of it as a takings. And this is just a statement of how you're providing for food, for the wildlife and joining a bunch of other people who are doing that and the National Wildlife Federation has given us this action step. So you certify with the National Wildlife Federation and then you're part of this trend. There's nearly 300,000 people certified in the nation now. And if you certify, you can also put up a sign. So we have our sign and, um, and the National Wildlife Federation sign that you can get once you know your number. So uh, this is the signs are nice one people call me and say well i can certify why can't can i get a sign i say sure once you certify um and then the sign kind of lets you gives you permission to be a little bit messy in the yard so the ideal habitat isn't pruned and and uh, and um you know and having all the se dead seeds taken off and and in deheading beheading or whatever different things it's letting things kind of get old and like the ocean spray, which is just beautiful in June, then it has kind of these dead little seeds on it. But if you sit there and watch a little bit, the chickadees start to kind of dangle from them and they, they chow down those little seeds that are dangling. So the signs help with saying, you know, I'm, I'm purposely being a little bit messy for the critters. So here are all the dots on the island. We have more dots than, than are on this map. We have 1,020 or 57, like I mentioned. So all throughout the island. So that's our goal that we're kind of linking habitats and um, parks and backyards, thinking of areas. So if you have a, um, a yard, area one is where you're close in and can watch what's going on where you might have the bird feeders up. Area two is where you might go through, but you're not there so much. And area three is like the backyard where um, you don't really go very often and you can kind of maybe put a brush pile there, which is real nice this time of year because it's good shelter. And um, those area threes can kind of mesh up and restore some corridors. Here are all the communities on the island. Tuck Willis started it out in 2002 and um, then we certified in 2005, and you can see it's, the Puget Sound area is kind of a regional wildlife habitat for the National Wildlife Federation. There are 158 in the country. We were the 10th in the nation and the second in the state to certify. So you can get more information from the National Wildlife Federation, great um, access to native plant lists and all sorts of things. 
Our website that Roxy does is fabulous as well. You can go and look at old programs as well as um, get a, a native plant list for the Pacific Northwest that is set up according to zones like sunny or shady, as well as um, is it narrow or a, a wide strip. And then it gets and it also talks about the layering aspect. So it tells you what would be good for ground cover in each of those areas, what would be good, good understory and what would be good for trees. So it's a great um, uh, native plant list that we have there. And, um, and when, I, um, when Ariana gets on and, and Catherine, they can tell you about the native plant sale that the Snohomish Conservation District is having. I think they, I think, did the order start now, I think? The In orders are, yeah, the online store is open right now. Um, Ariana, do you know how much longer it's staying open? I think we're keeping it open for two weeks. So it opened okay. last week, right? So another, yeah. another week or so. Okay. And then um, here are some references for the two books on top are written by Russell Link. He's a wildlife biologist for the state fish and wildlife department. And then the bottom one is, is more general for the nation, a little bit heavier on the East Coast, while the top two are definitely Pacific Northwest. And with that, um, I just want to tell you about our programs coming up. We have our programs the third Wednesday of the month. So in February, We'll have a program that's about woodpeckers, and Shona Aitken from the Wolf Hollow will be, uh, we'll do that via Zoom because she's not going to come from Friday Harbor to Kameno. That would be uh, too much to ask, but she's a great speaker. She works at with the re rehab center there, and so she will give us a woodpecker program. You can go and watch her owl program that we did last year and on our website. Then in March, it'll be about native plants and Brenda Cunningham is deciding whether she wants it Zoom or in person. And then in April, it will be about pollinators and that will be in person at the, the Blue Building, formerly Blue Building, excuse me, the Camino Multipurpose Center. Okay, with that, I will end my spiel and tell you about Ariana. So, Wait, did I? Okay, I have all these screens here. I'm sorry, I can't. I can't get this page off it off of here. Oh well, I'll worry about that later. Okay, so Ariana is a. Um, She's the beaver program lead for the Snohomish Conservation District. She is, um, she has a restoration ecology background and she, her, her big um, to do in her life is to promote beaver coexistence and the benefits of beavers and beaver ponds. So she also is a coordinator of two field crews in restoration projects with the Snohomish Conservation Districts. And beside that, she is um, works at the Beaver at Beavers Northwest on a part time basis. So she does a lot with beavers. And so we um, we want to welcome Ariana to learn more about the beavers who definitely don't get their just due and, and how important they are. So thank you, Ariana. And you're up. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. It's this is a very cool group. I learned a lot just from you, Val, right now. Um, I'm also here with Catherine Wells, um, who is our special projects administrator. Um, she'll be helping with the chat and and the presentation. Um, yeah, I think I'm sharing my screen now. Does it look good to everyone? Looks good. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like um, Val said, I'm here to talk about beavers. They can be um, a little bit of a nu nuisance if you want to call them that, um, but we want to live with them. So this presentation will talk about what beavers are, uh, why you want to coexist with them and some of those benefits um, and how to coexist. Um, 
Yeah, so we're from the Conservation District. Catherine can explain a little more. Yeah, so conservation districts are found all across the state and all across the country. Um, we work on a non-regulatory basis. So we voluntarily partner with um, people who have property and provide free technical assistance and sometimes even financial assistance to property owners and land managers, uh, not only in Snohomish County, but we serve Camino Island as well because we're closer than Whidbey, for example. Um, we work with both rural, rural and urban residents to improve habitat, soil health and productivity, resiliency to climate change and water quality through practices that are um, best management practices. What's been shown to be the practices that have been shown to improve water quality, improve resilience, improve habitat across the landscape. Uh, so no matter what kind of property you have, uh, we can probably uh, provide some guidance to you. Um, and if we aren't able to, then we have a wide network of partners that we work with as well, including WSU Extension, uh, Washington DNR, um, Snohomish County Master Gardeners, Camino Island Master Gardeners, Island County Master Gardeners. Uh, so we can hook you up with the people who can provide answers. Uh, for those of you who have forest land, uh, we have a really strong forest program now and with two foresters available to help you with stewardship plans, um, helping you uh, maintain and improve your soil or your forest health. Um, and, and then Ariana and her team, the Habitat and Habitat Restoration and Floodplain team uh, have the Living with Beavers program and uh, Native Plant program, et cetera. So um, lots of things we can help you with just anytime, reach out to us and we'd be happy to uh, provide assistance. So Ariana, I leave it to you. Thanks, Catherine. Yeah, Val already covered it. I just want to do a quick intro. Um, yes, I have a restoration ecology background. I came into restoration looking for ways to help wildlife um, and then found that wildlife, namely beavers, are great at restoration themselves. Um, so uh, I'm thinking about habitat as much as those animals. Um, I, yeah, I am a habitat restoration coordinator. So I coordinate a lot of plantings of these tiny little trees you can see there. Um, I also run the Living with Beavers program here at the district. Um, we really focus on coexistence and we'll talk about that throughout this whole slide, our whole presentation. And then um, always wanna give a shout out to my crews. They're doing the hard work out in the field um, and I couldn't do any of my work without them. So I just wanted to put them in there. That's me with them out um, installing a beaver coexistence device. But here, we're here to talk about beavers. Um, specifically, we'll talk about who they are, um, what they're doing, why we should care, and how um, private landowners and the conservation district can fit into all of that. Um, I'll have little question breaks throughout this and a couple of little polls that you can type in the chat, um, but feel free to put your questions. Um, I, I welcome questions. Um, so yeah, let's take our first poll. Um, have you ever seen a beaver? And if so, where have you seen it? Um, just kind of um, interested in that. And if you have seen a beaver, we'll go over if it's actually a beaver or some doppelganger out there. Okay, we don't have any answers in the chat yet. Um, feel free to, yeah, if you've seen a beaver and if so, where, go ahead and put that in the uh, in the chat. Oh, we've got a question, a hand raised. And it's, where'd it go? Isn't that strange? Okay. Ah, Lake Washington and Kenmore area, the small ponds at the north set, north part of Sunset Drive on that's on the west, northwest side of Kameno, uh, Sammamish River. Oh. Yeah. And the hand that was raised is down. So, okay. Great. Yes, beavers are all around and we'll talk about kind of where they hang out and where you can see them um, if you're looking. Um, and then I'm just kind of interested why you're interested in this talk. Um, again, we're focusing on, on coexistence, but I, 
you know, some people don't have beavers right in their backyard. Um, so I've just, I can tailor it however we want. Mm -hmm. So again, you can put that in the chat. Why are, why are you particularly here tonight? Sounds like, I mean, it's part of a great group of. Yeah. Oh, they're yeah. interesting to watch. Yes. Um, a couple people love beavers. Yes, me too. Yeah, they're pretty awesome. Um, we have beavers on the island and they need to get more respect. All right. <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> I love those damn animals. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yes. So some beaver enthusiasts, maybe. Um, yes. Sounds like yes. it. You're, you're in the you're in the right place. Um, so beavers are found throughout North America. Um, they, they're um, Castor canadensis. Um, there is a European beaver that's closely related, but a different different species. Um, wherever there's water and wood there's likely some beavers. Um, I've worked in um, some like stormwater detention ponds and just freeway runoff. And I've seen beavers there, they're very resilient, um, but they do need that water to create that their home. And then they eat, we'll go over this, but they need woody vegetation to eat and then to build, um, to build their homes and habitat. Um, Beavers are actually pretty large. I like to think about them as like a, a medium or large dog that can get up to 70 pounds um, as a grown adult. Um, and that is one of the main reasons or ways that you can tell them apart from other animals that may be swimming around in the similar ponds or streams. Um, for example, we have the nutria, which is invasive. Um, and it is it looks very similar. You know, it has those orange teeth. Um, and um, similar head shape where the eyes and the mouth are kind of parallel so they can swim, float on top of the water. Um, but the beaver, again, is gonna be much bigger um, and it's going to have uh, that rudder tail, flat leathery tail, as opposed to a rat tail like the nutria has. Um, and then we have our native muskrats. Those are very small, but again, kind of similar looking. I've mistaked, um, I've mistook in uh, baby beavers for muskrats and vice versa. So they, it is a little difficult to tell, but um, they're always gonna be very small. They're gonna have that rat tail. And um, yeah, that's the main way. Um, and then we also have river otters. Um, don't look totally the same, but if you see something swimming around, you know, in the, in the dusk hours, it's hard to tell. Um, they're not quite as, as big and they're not the same kind of round shape. Um, but they're very aquatic. And then I also can tell river otters from beavers by the way they move. They're a little more quick and agile. Um, I would say beavers are very agile and quick in the water, but um, you know, otters bring a whole nother level to it, I think. Um, yeah, so the main ways to identify beaver, um, those orange teeth, um, uh, that redder leathery tail, webbed back feet, and they're gonna be pretty big. And then of course, move over sides of beavers if you don't can't actually see the beaver itself. Oh, and then we have the mountain beaver, um, not, not related to the beaver whatsoever. Um, some of the damage or some of the habitat alterations that the mountain beaver does um, is blamed on the, the um, beaver, the castor canadensis is sometimes, but um, these mountain beavers are not in aquatic areas. They're, you know, very small, like two, up to two pounds and um, Again, not related, not aquatic. Um, so yeah, we kind of I kind of alluded to this. Uh, beavers um, are eat that woody vegetation. They're choosy, generalist herbivores. So they don't eat they don't eat fish or um, meat typically, um, but they will. They they do eat a lot of plants. Um, specifically, they love in our area. They love um, deciduous trees specifically willows. Um, and so that if a willow is there, they're gonna eat it. Um, if they don't have willow, they will expand to something else. So they can they can expand their diet, but they do have their favorite things that they prefer. Um, they eat the leaves, but they also eat the cambium layer right underneath the bark. And that is kind of a telltale sign of beavers um, that the, 
that a stick is denuded. So all of that bark is gone and you can see the little teeth marks in this the stick um, that they've eaten, um, as you can see in this picture. Um, but they also will, like in the summer months, if, if herbaceous material is around, they will eat herbaceous material. Um, again, they eat that leaves, they'll, they'll eat um, spatter dock and lily pad. Um, so this is, um, you know, beavers are actually nocturnal, so they're hard to see. Um, but if you see beaver activity, you know that beavers are around. So these are some telltale signs of beavers. Um, they usually cut down trees or sticks at an angle. Um, and you can see their, uh, the remaining bark that they've chewed off, a little sawdust pile. And um, you can also see their teeth marks in those cut woods. Um, yeah, if, if we were in person, I'd pass around some sticks. It's pretty cool to look at the little teeth marks, but keep an eye out. I'm sure there's some around you. Um, and they can, you know, they can be pretty fresh. If you see that that sawdust um, down below the shavings, um, or it can be pretty old, like that picture in the right top. Um, they do all this with um, their really cool orange teeth. Um, so again, normally if we were in person, I would pass around a, a beaver skull so you can see those up close and personal. Um, but these are great pictures. Um, they have orange teeth in the front because they are actually iron plated. So um, it's you know they need they need strong teeth to cut down trees. So um, you can see in that that lower picture that um, the front part is orange, um, inflated with iron, and then the back part is just enamel. So they're rodents. Their teeth will continuously grow, and while they grow, they um, will sharpen each other and leave that sharp iron point to it. Um, and then in the back, they just have normal kind of molars that they use to chew up vegetation or um, cambium. Um, another cool thing that you can kind of tell in this picture is that beavers have two sets of lips. So um, you can kind of see the gap between their back molars and their front orange teeth. Um, it's very hard to tell in a, without seeing the school, but um, they have that so that they can carry stuff in their mouths underwater without drowning and they can be more productive that way. They've also, they can also chew underground or underwater. <laughs> um, so that's a, kind of a fun fact. Um, but yeah, that's that's a really cool way to tell a beaver. Um, very um, interesting how they are iron plated. Um, and actually willow leaves have a really high concentration of iron. So that is one theory about where they get all their iron, but they do derive it from their environment, obviously. Um, yeah, another telltale sign of beavers is their dams. Um, and we'll go over the benefits of dams and why they do it. Um, but dams can come in many shapes, forms, styles, um, materials. I've seen beavers use, you know, sticks, of course, mud, grass, um, garbage, sometimes invasive. I've seen them use blackberry. Sometimes they'll, they're, um, they're not choosy in what they use on their dams, in my opinion, <laughs> um, but they are choosy what they eat. Um, so these are all kind of pictures of dams. They can vary in size and shape, like I was talking about. Um, a lot of times they'll build them in series. So um, they'll build a large dam and then downstream of it, they'll build a smaller dam. Um, and that's to support the larger dam, but also just to increase that habitat. Um, so yeah, basically the dams and these wetlands that the dams create are very messy. I loved when Val was talking about creating a messy yard. Um, that's exactly what beavers would want um, <laughs> and what they would create with, for you. Um, and so yeah, dams, if you see a, a stick mud thing holding back water, that's likely a beaver. You can look at those sticks and material to, to see for those angled cuts and um, teeth marks and those all point to a beaver. They don't live in those dams though. They just, those dams hold back water. They live in lodges. Um, they can be pretty large. They can be either in the middle of a pond or they can be on the bank called a bank lodge or den. Um, they kind of look like teepees a little bit, um, that shape. Um, but the, again, they'll be made of sticks or mud or grass. Um, and the sometimes sometime it's really hard to tell what um, a lodge is because plants will actually grow from the lodge. Um, it's a little easier to tell in the winter when the leaves are off and um, it's kind of more bare. Um, so if you 
are looking for a lodge, I recommend looking in the winter and then remembering where it is and then going back in the summer to watch those beavers come out of the lodge. Um, yeah, these lodges have um, underwater entrances. So they're building dams to create a flooded environment to one, access food better, um, to also, also create this underwater entrance for their lodge. Um, like I was talking about, they're, they're aquatic animals. They feel most comfortable in the water. They have those webbed feet. They have that rudder tail. They have a double coat fur. They can close their little ears. They have two eyelids and two, two uh, lips. Um, so they feel really comfortable in the water. Um, outside of the water, they're a little awkward. Um, they are feel more vulnerable to predators. So their lodge is kind of their safe spot. It only has an underwater entrance, otherwise it's completely covered. So only them or maybe a muskrat can enter that, that lodge and um, their predators like coyotes or bobcats or cougars cannot enter that lodge. Um, and they have a safe little nesting environment as well. Um, yeah, they're pretty cool. Uh, once you see one, uh, you'll see them around more often, but again, they're kind of hard to tell. Um, you kind of have to keep your eye out. Um, like I was talking about, they create that nesting nesting um, chamber as well. They can snack there, but they also raise their young there. Um, this is a photo from One Beaver Lodge. Um, they're a family group, so um, they uh, will have um, kits every year, and then um, those kits will stay with the mated pair for um, two years, and then they'll disperse. So. Um, at a time, there I like to say about six beavers in a lodge. Um, if you know, if they've had multiple um, years of breeding, um, there'll be the adults, the uh, juveniles, and then the baby kids. Um, so um, that is very cute. If you can see a baby and um, or hear it, they're very vocal, actually, um, and. Um, because of the kind of like family structure, they are um, territorial. So um, they have a range, it's about a kilometer where they don't want other beavers. Um, they'll create scent mounds, which is another kind of telltale sign of beavers. It's just like a pile of sticks and mud again, <laughs> um, but it smells, they release a scent on it and it smells really musky and almost sweet. Um, so if you smell that smell in uh, the wild, take a look around, see if you see a little pile of mud and sticks that beavers have marked their territory on. Um, and um, yeah, so at two, those sub-adults will disperse and then they won't be allowed back in their original colony. Um, I've heard that beavers are nicer to their family members as opposed to a stranger beaver, um, but they still, you know, want their own. Um, yeah. Um, uh, let's see what else I missed about beavers. That was my main spiel about beavers. Um, they, yeah. Does anyone have any questions before I move on to their benefits? Yes, we do have some questions. Um, let's see, are there any beavers in Mexico? I believe so. Yes. Um, I, I would have to look, but I believe so. Um, the Lutria does come from Latin America. So I think there is a a divide there, but I'm not sure exactly where. Okay. And then another question, not about beavers, but river otters. Um, do you happen to know where uh, some can be found? Um, let's see, Val is saying, the question was, can river otters be found on Camino? And I know that they can be, but I don't know where exactly they can be found. Um, Val has seen them in the bays and shorelines around Camino. Do you happen to know, Ariana? Have you ever seen any when you're out there? No. No, not on, not on Camino, unfortunately, but um, they're definitely, they're definitely also kind of ubiquitous around, um, yeah. especially short, you know, short lines. Too. Okay. Uh, and then a question, how big of a tree will beavers cut down? What's the, di what size diameter tree will they? Oh, take? that's a great question. Um, they have a preference. So they prefer like a medium to small sized diameter tree. Um, one where they can get a good amount of material, but uh, can easily cut down. Honestly, I don't think that there's a limit uh, to what beavers will take. Um, 
they're pretty tenacious. If there's a tree they want down, they'll take it down. It will take, you know, if they don't need to do it overnight. Um, sometimes they'll start on a really big one, chew it like halfway through and then leave it. Um, a lot of the projects we help with are trying to retain those big, large diameter trees for habitat and for the carbon they sequester um, from beavers. So we do tree protection, which is uh, just one of the ways we coexist. Um, but yeah, they'll definitely take large trees. Uh, they'll take almost almost anything out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I don't see any other questions at this time. Great, okay, I will move on, but yes, love the question. So we talked about what beavers are um, and who they are, what are they doing out there? Basically, they're just um, building dams to create more habitat, a safe space for themselves, increase that wetted area for um, access to food and also um, to increase the likelihood of their favorite foods being present. Um, their favorite foods like willows love wet environments. So um, some people call beavers ecosystem, well, they call them ecosystems engineers, which we'll go over, but also farmers um, because they're changing that environment to increase their favorite foods, um, which is pretty cool. Um, but beyond why they do it, um, it also creates um, a lot of benefits to the greater environment. Um, they can take something like this and turn it into to this. So they just create more complexity. Um, all of these little piles of um, uh, little lines of vegetation you see growing are likely old beaver dams. Um, so they um, increase, um, they change that environment altogether and um, create complexity, which adds multiple benefits, which we'll go over. Um, they change that environment. Um, so we call them ecosystem engineers. You know, they take a streamside or a ditch and then create a wetland, which is very um, unique and very important. Um, so like I said, they build that aquatic um, habitat by creating homes for themselves via that pond and that dam. Um, they increase the aquatic habitat and change the habitat and plant communities. Um, whenever we're coexisting with beavers, we want to look at how much wetland they've already created and how much the plants have already responded to that. Um, some plants can't ha handle that increased wetness, which is uh, creates a lot of dead snags, like you can see, see here, um, which are great for birds like the Pileated Woodpecker, um, pods, uh, ponds are also a great habitat for many different waterfowl and um, insects. Um, amphibians, of course, need that kind of edge wetland habitat to lay their eggs and breed. Um, so uh, amphibians love beaver ponds as well. Um, and the, they also appreciate those fallen wood and um, sticks. And then um, like these amphibians, fish, uh, river otters, which we just talked about, and other predators like great blue herons also hang around these ponds because there's more food, there's more habitat, there's more refuge um, for them to live. So they're, again, they're creating this great habitat that's used by so many different species. Um, yeah, and then another benefit, oh, um, so I did include fish in this uh, example of, you know, uh, animals that use beaver ponds as habitat. Um, a lot of people are concerned about beaver dams and fish passage. You know, a beaver dam is considered, can be a barrier. It's large above that, that water column um, and does require fish that are migrating up to jump. Um, but they're just saying that fish, or that beavers taught fish how to jump, um, specifically our salmon. Um, typically when they're moving upstream, they're larger and um, can maybe handle that jump. And then they're also traveling during times of uh, high flows where there's gonna be um, passage around or through the dams, especially when they're juveniles. So juveniles will be moving downstream um, with when those uh, high flood events are happening and create um, a lot of pathways around. Um, juveniles also use the beaver ponds as a uh, resting place. So they'll eat all those good insects, they'll rest, they'll hide under all the complexity that the beavers have created and um, 
get get big and fat, hopefully. Um, and then they make their way downstream uh, whenever there is an opening um, with water. I've seen fish wait in beaver ponds and then when a rain event happens, they all kind of migrate down. So it's all part of their journey. Beavers and fish in this area have coexisted for a long time. They've co-evolved. Um, so when I am asked if beavers cause a fish passage problem, I would say no. Um, whenever a problem occurs, it's not necessarily because of the beavers, because of the way we've modified the environment and then the beaver came in and modified it even more. Um, yeah. And so all in all, I would say salmon uh, really benefit from uh, beavers because of that increased aquatic environment. And then also beaver dams improve water quantity. Um, so they will hold that water back. They provide uh, flood storage. They attenuate those floods and recharge the groundwater. So you can see in this little diagram that by holding that water back, um, the beaver ponds will recharge groundwater. The, the pond's so heavy and will stay there for a long time that uh, water will get pushed uh, into the ground, recharge aquifers, and then also pop up um, downstream through the groundwater. And um, they um, provide inputs. Um, you know, beaver dams are great at holding back water, but they're not 100%. They, they are porous. So in the summertime, they'll be holding back all this water um, and then water will trickle through dams and create um, water quantity when sometimes we don't have water quantity where the stream may dry up, a beaver pond can help um, improve water quantity and improve stream flow all year round. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, again, you know, we think of beaver dams flooding, but they attenuate floods, they create extra storage. So when we have a flashy flood, it would, may just like barrel downstream and flood all the way down. Um, but beaver dams will have some capacity to store some of that back and make it a flood less, a flashy flood less severe. Um, so on top of quantity, they also improve water quality, which is great for salmon. Um, all that sediment that's moving downstream um, will drop, you know, water slows down, sediment and pollutants will drop out of the water um, column because it's slowed down. Um, there's gonna be, so that's better sediment retention. Um, because of that, there's gonna be better gravel downstream, which is really important for um, spawning salmon. Um, ponds will clean up that water. Like I said, those pollutants will drop out. Um, a lot of times uh, nitrogen and phosphorus levels are reduced in these wetlands. Um, it's also, they have more interaction with the plant communities around them. So that helps with uh, filtering as well. So to summarize, we got better, more aquatic habitat, uh, which means increases in birds, mammals, fish, amphibians, bugs, um, great refuge for juvenile salmon. Um, they provide um, better water quality, um, like we just talked about. And then they also improve water quantity throughout the entire year. They attenuate those floods and then have great cold water inputs during the summer. All this is to say that they increase ecosystem resilience. Um, this is kind of like a normal stream flow here in Western Washington. Um, in the winter, it's gonna get high. In the summer, it's gonna get low um, throughout. Um, with climate change, these are just you know getting more extreme. Wet gets wetter, the, the dry gets drier. Um, we're seeing more droughts. Um, we're seeing changes in our snowpacks and all that. Um, so this is kind of what climate change does to our stream flows. When you introduce beavers back into that, um, it kind of returns back to normal. Again, they attenuate those winter floods, so they hold back that water, um, and not all of it will, will just exit downstream. And then in the summertime, they'll release cold water through their dams and through groundwater. Um, so we're creating, they're creating just a more resilient um, ecosystem. And then there's been a lot of research and discussion lately about how um, beavers help with wildfires, which is another thing that we're seeing in light of climate change. Um, 
they've increased that wetted area and you know moist plants and and wetted area are less likely to burn um, and less likely to be impacted by any wildfires. They create great refuge for wildlife during the fires and um, burned areas will recover quicker um, after fires go through because of that beaver pond um, is available to them. So that's pretty, pretty amazing. I know um, there's a couple of groups in Eastern Washington that are really trying to encourage beavers because of this, this fact and that they want to um, utilize all of the benefits they can provide. Um, so kind of just a, this is a, a good diagram of the impact that beavers can have. Um, many of our streams, again, kind of look like this. They, they may be incised, they may not have a very good uh, floodplain, may be relatively dry on that floodplain. Um, and then beavers come in and create complexity. They'll chew down those trees, they'll create dams, um, increase that water table. And then um, eventually that will be a restored stream where um, the water is interacting with the floodplain very well. Um, water is stored, water is cleaned. Um, and again, we're creating that great habitat. Um, so this is an example about BDA, which are beaver dam analogs, which is one restoration technique where we're trying to mimic beavers. Um, but if you just let beavers do what they're gonna do, um, it works almost it's almost better. Um, so those are kind of the main benefits I wanted to talk about. Um, are there any questions before I move on to beaver management? None at the moment. Okay. Um, Great. Yeah. Let's give it just another few seconds to see if anybody's going to throw something in the chat. There is somebody here who had a question about the benefits of beaver. Um, they have dams on their property in northeastern Washington near Medellin Falls. I'm not sure if that's how you oh, pronounce okay. it. So, um, yeah, so I'm glad you mentioned eastern Washington. Yeah, similar thing. Yeah, increasing the summer flows, um, reducing that wildfire risk. Um, kind of those are the main ones I would think in Northeast. Cool. I am not seeing any questions at this time. So yeah, let's move on. Cool, yeah. Um, despite all of those great benefits and their very cute um, presence in our environment, um, they still can cause issues. Um, mainly, um, they'll chew down trees. You know, they may chew down uh, fruit trees or they may chew down those really large um, old growth trees, or um, they may just chew down trees that landowners like and want to keep there. Um, they also will block culverts. Um, it's a really easy spot for them to target and dam up. Um, and so that creates a fish passage barrier that we want to address. And then it also, um, you know, we don't want to be, we want to utilize our roads if we have them. So um, we want to protect those culverts as much as possible. And then just general flooding. Those dams, again, increase that water level and make places that weren't wet. wet. Um, however, there are solutions. And I, I, does this go until eight or 8.30? Um, we're, I think it's somewhat, flood. I mean, it, okay. our programs have always been kind of, you know, eight yeah. to 8.30ish, so yeah. But. Okay, I can go through these pretty pretty quick too. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so there's solutions. Um, some. Some land managers and landowners um, do trapping and relocating. Um, it is legal to trap and kill beavers on your own property, um, but you have to use live traps. You can hire trappers to trap beavers and kill them um, during the fair burr season. Um, we don't really, I don't recommend that for sure, um, but relocation is an option if there's a beaver that um, is in a really unopportune place and it's causing a lot of issues. Um, the Tulalip Beaver Project is just one relocator. So they'll trap the beavers. Um, they have to be nuisance and you'd have to, they have to be causing a problem to your infrastructure or safety. And they have to, um, you have to have tried coexistence first before they'll trap and relocate them. But um, it's really cool because the Tulalip Beaver Project will um, take these beavers and put them in hydraulically impaired tributaries in the upper watersheds um, and that will create better fish rearing habitat, water storage. Um, it's kind of a restoration technique 
that they're using to get beavers back in the places that beavers maybe can't get to because it's too high up in the watershed right now. Um, so that's one option. Um, it is very, both relocation and uh, lethal trapping are very short term. Um, if one beaver thought that your backyard was a good habitat, another beaver probably will too. Um, and like I said, every two years they're dispersing and finding new habitat. So um, it's short term. Some people do it because they don't think there's another solution, but they're having to trap every year. Um, and then other people will do it to create some time to prepare for the beavers um, to come back and eventually return. Another way um, that um, you can kind of relocate beavers without relocating them and trapping them is um, encouraging their establishment. So if they're in an incorrect location that's kind of problematic, you can maybe encourage them to establish somewhere else on your property um, through what well, I was just talking about beaver dam analogs. Um, and you kind of create the structure for them up front um, and say, hey, look here, this is a great place to build a dam. Do you want to move here? Um, and then of course, increasing that um, the food available for them, the native plantings. Um, this is a picture of live steaks that we live staked <clears throat> a whole riparian corridor. So um, again, if there's water and food, they'll come. Um, and then if you add that structure in for them, um, they can also, you know, we're encouraging it. It's, it's a beaver will do whatever it wants. So um, it's one strategy in that larger set of strategies. Um, oh, Ariana, yeah. uh, Roxy just confirmed that it is scheduled for one and a half hours. So you can take your time. <laughs> okay, I'll still go quick. <laughs> Um, yeah, so you're just creating that place for it to build and then you're giving them food and building material. This is something I want to try out more with landowners because um, sometimes landowners have great habitat just beyond where the beaver is building and you can um, work in conjunction of like notching the dam and creating this other the established dam and then creating a better place for them to build. Um, just want to plug in that um, putting log structures in your creek and also modifying a beaver dam in any way does require a permit from Fish and Wildlife, which is free. And I help people through that a lot, but um, definitely we wanna do it correctly without harming fish or the habitat. Um, so those do require permits. Um, again, tree chew is a, is a really big problem. It has a pretty simple um, solution that's pretty effective. Um, you wanna uh, tree, wrap the tree with some fencing I've seen people put chicken wire on trees and staple it to the tree. That's not something I recommend because um, one, the tree's gonna outgrow that and it's gonna get, it's gonna hurt the tree. Um, and then two, beavers are again, really tenacious. So they will chew through that chicken wire. And if they're able to get to the bark, they'll still probably chew it. Um, so we recommend this type of fencing here. Um, the fencing should be pretty tall. Again, beavers are pretty, pretty big. Um, I recommend three to four feet and you want you want it pretty sturdy because um beavers are really determined and they will lean on on fencing to get to the tree they'll try to like push the fencing up and get under the fencing they won't necessarily dig but um they can definitely try to modify your fence so you want a tall sturdy sturdy fence around your tree and then you also just want to leave some some room for your tree to grow um, the other main conflict is uh, beaver or culvert, culvert blockage. Um, there's something called, you may have heard of a beaver deceiver. Um, this is kind of what it is. Uh, it's, I call it an exclusion fence. Um, you just remove that dam in that culvert one because um, it's probably causing flooding. It's causing some risk to your culvert and roadway. But also a blocked culvert is a fish passage barrier and we don't want that. Um, so where we remove that dam, and we put this um, big fence around it. So we're increasing the area that the beaver would have to dam in order to, to uh, stop the water. Um, and then also um, we are, um, they can't get through that little fence. So um, they aren't able to get to that culvert to block. Um, these are, I would say culvert exclusion fences is, are pretty efficient. Um, again, it's a structure in a screen, so it does require some permitting, um, but they're pretty simple and pretty effective. For general flooding, it, it's a little more complicated. 
um, we um, utilize flow devices. So previously, you may have heard that um, pond levelers are a great solution to be reflooding, and that involves putting a pipe through the dam at a notch location and then caging out that um, upstream end so that beavers can't block that pipe. Um, Fish and Wildlife doesn't view these as fish passable. They don't really permit them anymore. You know, we're trying to get away from pipes and small culverts in our streamways, stream, stream um, waterways. Um, so these aren't necessarily permitted anymore. Um, and they there's some questions on fish passability. Um, so we have switched to something called a notch exclusion fence, which is taking that culvert exclusion fence and kind of putting it on a dam. Um, you can see here that you notch the dam just, just enough to prevent infrastructure risk or safety risk, but um, as little as possible, because we want to retain that habitat, we want to retain beavers, um, we want to retain all those benefits. Um, so you notch it, and then you put that fence on the notch, and then the downstream end will be tiered down to the stream bottom so that fish can have a little pool inside the fence to jump over the dam. Um, so we're thinking about fish, thinking about beavers, we're thinking about people and just how to coexist all together. Um, so this is the primary um, method I use for flooding concerns um, when a beaver dam is just too too tall. Um, yeah, we just talked about all these. Um, and I just wanna say that Snohomish Conservation District can help with all these. Um, we provide um, technical assistance throughout Snohomish County and Camino Island, like um, Catherine already mentioned. Um, and um, we may not have financial, right now we don't have any grant funding for Camino Island beaver coexistence, but we're still a great resource to get you started, point you in the direction of someone that may be able to implement something for you or just provide all that knowledge and help you with a permit and that sort of thing. Um, feel free to reach out. Um, here are beavers throughout Snohomish County and Camino Island. Um, this is through iNaturalist, which I encourage you to use. Um, if you don't know what it is, it's a citizen science app that you can upload observations of different wildlife or plants, beavers included. I mean, it's a cool way to see where beaver hotspots are. Um, so all of these are certified and have pictures along with them. Um, kind of zoomed in here, you can see that there's only three iNaturalist spots on Camino Island. That is, I know that there's more beavers out there, um, but this is a good place to start if you're looking to see beavers or thinking about where beavers may be. Um, I know that Triangle Cove has a lot of beavers um, and it sounds like you all know um, where beavers may be. Remember to look for that chewed vegetation, dams and lodges um, and hot spots like wetlands or culverts. Um, that is a picture on the right of um, fish passage barriers that um, are likely culverts and where beaver beavers are also likely to um, target. So what can I, what can we help you with? We can do site visits. We can help you with that permit to install coexistence measures. We can help you get materials if we have the right funding and we can help you install it if we, again, if we have that right, that correct funding. And then the conservation district can just do a lot more too. We have that plant sale that we want to promote um, native plants. We help with, um, we're just, you know, Catherine already covered it, um, just stewardship of the land for conservation. If you're interested in learning more about beavers, there's some other great resources. Um, we have, King County has a great uh, beaver work products with a couple of different um, articles and um, handouts and um, great diagrams. Um, I, I learn from there all the time. They do great, great research there. Um, Better Ground, uh, the districts have a beaver fact sheet. Um, your neighborhood beaver, friend or foe, I hope that we all agree that they're our friend. And then um, Fish and Wildlife, Department of Fish and Wildlife has a great Living with Beavers page as well. Um, and finally, if you're if you're really looking to dig deep, um, there is a beaver restoration guidebook by US Fish and Wildlife Service um, that talks about kind of what we've talked about and then how to use beavers to restore areas. Um, and that is kind of my goal here at the district and throughout my work. 
Um, we have a couple upcoming events. Um, if you want to hear this talk again, but a little modified and go on a field tour um, of a coexistence project, um, that will be happening actually this Saturday at Lake Stevens Library, 1030 to 1230. Um, I encourage anyone to come. I'll have that those beaver skulls and sticks and uh, we'll get to walk to an uh, actual flow device, which is pretty cool. Um, and then we have the Wazoo Country Living Expo and Modern Homesteading Conference. Catherine, do you want to talk about that at all or is that pretty useful? Sure. Yeah, it, it does require registration and you can, but you can find that on our website as well at um, snohomishcd.org slash events. Um, it's a full Saturday of of a, a huge variety of classes that you can attend. Uh, we'll be having classes on soil testing and noxious weed control, but um, you can take classes on um, taking care of your sheep, training your dogs, um, taking care of bees, beekeeping, you name it, there's a class on it. Oh, chainsaw maintenance, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. it's a good one and that's coming up pretty soon as well. And we will be there. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, we do a lot of cool events. Um, and then we're that plant sale is coming up a uh, shop now and pick up in March. We also rely on volunteers to help with hmm. um, getting all those plants out the door. So if you're interested in volunteering, feel free to hop on our website. Um, yeah, that's all I got. Um, thank you for listening and I'm happy to answer more questions. Again, I'm here to help you coexist with beavers. Um, so please reach out if you ever encounter questions. We do have a question um, back to, let's see here, the flow devices. Um, they they look kind of flimsy. How long do they usually last or do you have to replace them? Like how do you secure them well enough? And then I have a question on, you know, if there's a salmon in the flow device, I guess if they have gotten into the flow device, then they can get back out of it again. So yeah, question, yeah great guess, question. technical questions about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I use T post to secure um the fencing, so it, it is a little flimsy. Um, we we secure each pan. These are uh, cattle pat panels that we've flipped and cut and then connected with um hog rings, and then um we secure it. We pound the T post into the ground in the stream bed and the dam, and then wire that really tightly. Um. They definitely require maintenance and monitoring. So, you know, a big storm event might come around and knock one of your key posts or remove one of your wires or create a gap. And that's something you can pretty easily fix. Um, I, For the most part, I would say they last a, a good amount of time. Um, your permit's gonna, gonna last for 10 years if you get a standard permit. Um, but I, yeah, they definitely require that maintenance and monitoring, but overall, I think they're pretty effective. And then, yeah, the, back to the fish. Um, again, these are permitted by Fish and Wildlife. So our mesh size, fencing size is six by eight. Um, and that Fish and Wildlife typically doesn't let us go any smaller than that because um, they want fish to be able to pass through our fence. Um, so that is one way we prevent fish getting stuck in our, stuck in our devices. Too. Got it, thank you. Uh, when is the best time of day to see beavers? Yeah, they're nocturnal. Um, I They're really hard to see in the winter unless you use a flashlight, which I don't know if I recommend. Um, but in the summertime, um, they're, they're pretty easy to see actually because it gets light so early. So if you go around dusk or dawn, um, you'll likely see beavers swimming around. Um, beavers Northwest, who I work part-time for, does nature walks um, in the summertime and we go to places that we we no, basically no, uh, beavers will be out and um, we get to view those. But yeah, just again, look around for those signs. And then it comes summertime when it's light, really late, um, take a look for beavers. Um, dawn or dusk are the best times. Do you wanna show that video, that short video that we have of the, that Elisa mm -hmm. took of, do you have, I can, I can pull it up if you'd. Okay, yeah. Let me see what, if I can find it here. What did I stop sharing my screen? And are there other questions? Um, 
You might want to change your spelling on registration. Oh. On your slide. Oh yeah, thank you. Oh, oops. About your upcoming. Um, oh yes, yeah, I see it for the the oops, Washington sorry about that. Countries Living Expo. Yeah, thank you. We're always we're always improving these um, presentations somehow. I had a for the wildfire. I had wildlife resilience for the longest time. Um, oh, until I figured it out. <laughs> So there were some excellent places listed in the chat. I'm not sure everybody saw those about where beavers are seen on Camino. I know I've seen them at desk in the summer on at the ponds on Sunset. And Elcher Bay. Where else? There were several other places listed. There are viewing platforms at Elger Bay and at um off of Cancun Road, across from the um, uh, the uh -huh. Casa, but there at at that place you can see a beaver deceiver, and um, there's a platform. And if you go back there and sit, some people have sat, you know, in early morning or at dusk, and um, to kind of see if they can see beavers. But what's fascinating is beyond where that platform is, it's just uh, it's it's what the beaver habitat and what they've done there. This kind of um, the, they're trying to do conservation futures monies to get that. I know Barbara was, Brock was really active with that, but they um, they didn't go for protecting that. But I think the Christoffersons have done something. It, it's Christofferson land. Anyway, it's um, it's amazing the, the, the pictures they showed of this beaver habitat that's beyond the, the where the little platform is. But um, so there's a big beaver activity there. And the beaver deceiver was created because it was flooding uh, it was almost a risk of flooding East Camino Drive, and also it was flooding. I think there's a little storage shed right in the corner of Cancun Road, um, the north side of Casa, and um, so they did the deceiver in that um, took care of the flooding. Mm -hmm. Iverson has a bunch of beavers as well, because I know that they the trails Fosip has to work with the trails sometimes there. So where was this taken? That's a great question. Um, yeah. I'm not totally sure. Catherine, do you know? I mean, it's in front of a really big culvert. Um, so this was um, one of those culvert exclusion fences. You can see that a beaver is building, rebuilding their dam kind of on the side. Um, and that is totally fine for all exclusion fences. We want them to actually continue focusing on this area because we have control of this one area. Um, and as long as it doesn't block passage through the middle, um, it's it's pretty effective. Catherine, I don't know if you know where. Yeah, no, I don't remember where that is. Um, I just remember being very excited um, to yeah. um, see the video. <laughs> Yeah, uh, when you go out looking for beavers, I also encourage uh, you bring binoculars because you may see something swimming around in the water. And again, there's so many aquatic things in the water that you may not know what it is. So bring those binoculars, confirm it's a beaver, and you get to you know see further out. And it's particularly hard to see at dusk sometimes. Totally, yeah. Other questions? Anybody have beavers on their property? Not tonight. Okay. There's well, a in the um, chat. I wrote down a book. I read. I went to a Nas the National Wildlife Federation had a little uh, webinar, and Ben Farb Goldfarb was there talking about his book and his research with beavers. And it's really a fun book to read, and you learn um, a lot about beavers. Uh, although Ariana, I liked how you showed us about le we learned about the beavers and the benefits, and then how to live with them. Um, I thought that was well done. And um, and so Ben will give you even more details on on beavers to supplement what Ariana gave us. And yeah. in our library, both the um, book and the the audiobook version. It's a great book. Yes, yeah. There's a couple good books. There's also Beaver Land, which is relatively newer than this one, but 
again, eager is like kind of the basis for all eager believers. Um, and then there's also one called, um, I think it's called Beaver Sprite. And that is kind of whimsical. It's about a, a lady who raised beavers um, and gets to learn about the behavior. There's lots of cool photos in it. Um, so that's Has everybody heard of Justin Beaver? He was a, a rehab beaver and there are a whole series of videos on YouTube um, through like the dodo. Uh, you could just Google Justin Beaver and it's super, super cute. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much, both of you for coming. We really appreciated it. It's uh, really exciting to hear about some of these animals that are doing so much to restore our, some of the things that we've taken down. So sometimes just leaving nature will heal itself. Bye-bye, <laughs> thank you all. Thank you.